Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, JC. Hi, Cindy. Today, we're going to be talking about patio doors, and we'd like to thank Lil Bribri for liking and sharing the podcast. The oldest sliding doors archaeologists have found so far have been found in the ruins of Pompeii in Italy. We yeah. love Pompeii. <laughs> well, it's fascinating how mm-hmm. all this stuff has been preserved. So it, after the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD, it buried all this stuff, just locked it in time. So mm-hmm. it's pretty fascinating. And they also found folding doors in Pompeii. Hmm. After World War II, sliding patio doors became a real popular style in suburban homes. What did they have before that? Just a uh, back door. <laughs> Three main styles with patio doors. You have sliding, swinging, and folding with the sliding patio doors, and sometimes they're called gliding or bypass. Mm-hmm. Primarily two doors, one that's stationary or inactive, and one that's primarily your door, so the active part. You have a very large area of glass, so you have great light, great mm-hmm. view, and for a home with a contemporary look, mm-hmm. it makes a, a nice visual. And then the sliding design doesn't take up any space as it opens and closes, so furniture doesn't get in the way. And then they're even on the outside, some of them swing out. Right. And with these sliding doors, if you have a home that settles, Mm -hmm. it's the easiest to adjust over time. Do any of these doors have two sliding doors? So Stanley had a double sliding door. Stanley does have a double sliding door that has handles on both sides, and so you can open either side, and that was rated very high. That's fancy. With swinging patio doors, you have center hinged or French. With the center hinged or center hung, you have two doors, one that's stationary, and then the active door is hinged right in between them. Mm -hmm. With the French patio doors, you have two doors that are hinged at the side jams. So now you have a very wide opening when both doors are open. And there's usually one main active door and then one that's passive, but it can be opened. Mm -hmm. And this is fantastic for moving in furniture into your home, for parties. For air movement, so if you have screens built in on a track, so they would be sliding, right. now you can open both doors and you get great air movement. So and you have a screen on both sides then? Right, you can have, yeah, depending hmm. on the model. Interesting. And then the threshold is going to be a little lower than sliding doors, and these can either open in or out. Mm-hmm. If you get an outswing, they have special locking hinges or non-removable pins hmm. on the hinges. That's probably smart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With folding patio doors, these open in accordion style, so they're sliding along a track on the top and the bottom, and the doors are hinged to each other, Mm -hmm. and you can get these primarily with two doors next to each other, but you can get two, three, or four doors. You can get three or four sections all connected, or you could have two panels that fold one direction and two that fold the other direction, (laughs) or I've seen it where you have one active door that you primarily use, and it has two doors next to it that fold against the opposite jam if you want to just completely open the up for a mm-hmm. party or move furniture in so just a, a very expensive look and they are more expensive mm-hmm. and there's more but you parts. Have a lot more options yeah and it's it's definitely a distinctive look mm-hmm. yeah, and it's it's a lot more labor to install these <laughs> what type of materials do these doors come in so you can get wood wood clad fiberglass vinyl aluminum composite a wide variety mm-hmm. with wood this is popular for a traditional look it is it gives, real wood you can get real wood, very energy efficient, <laughs> takes a bump, it's easy to fix scratches, but they definitely require maintenance. They mm-hmm. can expand and contract with the weather. So I would look at the warranty. Like, for example, Geld Wen, they've got a treatment called Aura Last. Can spell that? J- J-E-L-D dash W-E-N. Thank you. So this company puts this wood protectant onto their wood, and it, they give it a 20-year warranty oh, wow. against wood rot. That's you, nice. You can also get wood clad. So this is a layer of aluminum or fiberglass or some other material over the wood to protect the wood. Mm -hmm. And you can have it clad inside and out or just on the outside and Mm -hmm. then have the natural wood on the inside so you can stain that to match your decor. With fiberglass, this comes in a wide range of colors and textures. You can get the look of wood, Mm -hmm. and it'll stand up to a wide range of temperature and moisture. Generally, it has an inner foam core, so it's lightweight, energy efficient, very low maintenance. Mm -hmm. And then down the road, you can either paint it or stain it as it gets older. The only downside with fiberglass is it can crack with hard impact. That's a bummer. 
With steel, these are very durable. Many of these are very low cost, and it comes in a variety of finishes. It resists dents and warping, and then scratches can be repaired with primer and paint. Mm -hmm. These are treated to prevent rust, and they're good for a wide range of climates. Most of these will have a foam core for energy efficiency. Vinyl is inexpensive, energy efficient, it stands up to moisture, it's very low upkeep, it's not going to fade, peel, or rot, but some vinyl can crack in wide changes in temperature, hmm. so these are great for moderate climates. And then I would look at the warranty that's going to guide you if you live in an area that gets extremely hot or cold, right. look at something that has a very good warranty. Mm -hmm. With aluminum, they're very durable, and it's usually a skin over wood or a composite material. It's lightweight. They come in a range of colors and textures, corrosion resistant, although they can dent. And aluminum's good for most climates, mm -hmm. although it can be damaged by salt water and some chemicals. Hmm. When I was looking at a couple of the manufacturers, they listed the material on some of their doors as composite. What so, does that mean? so exactly. So it could be a variety of materials. I would look at the warranty as a guide for the quality. Hmm. When you're looking at patio doors, you want to look for low E glass, and this is the ability for the glass to radiate heat. So it's a microscopic metallic coating that's reducing heat transfer, but it's allowing the light to pass through. Right, we talked about this with the Windows episode, yeah, right? Yeah, pretty amazing. In the summer, it's reflecting heat out, and then it keeps heat in during mm -hmm. the winter. And it's also blocking UV rays to protect your carpets and furniture from fading. And you can get two pane or three pane. Three pane is going to be more energy efficient, but mm -hmm. it's more costly. Really effective, especially in northern climates or in, or in areas where it's very cold. When you're looking at patio doors, you're going to see U-factor and R-value. The U-factor is measuring heat transfer, and this ranges from 0.25 to 1.25. The lower the number, the better when you're comparing them. Hmm. And then to be Energy Star rated, you want a U-factor, or it has to have a U-factor. If you have more than half of the door glass, it has to have a U-factor of 0.30 or less. And then the R factor is just how good the door is at resisting heat flow. So the higher the number on the R value, the better. And this is related to U factor. So for example, the best U factor of a 0.25 is going to give you an R value of 4. And then the highest U factor, 1.25, is going to give you an R value of 0.8. I think everything should just be a letter grade, like A through F. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. You'll also see SHGC, so this is solar heat gain coefficient, and this is the ability for the glass on the door to block the sun's heat. Mm -hmm. And you want more blocking in hot climates, and you might want less blocking in cold climates, so actually get some passive heat gain. Hmm. You'll also see air leakage. On sliding doors, you want 0.3 or less. On swinging doors, you want 0.25 or less. You'll also see DP, or Design Pressure Rating, and this is how well it handles airflow. Mm -hmm. So a DP50 handles a wind load at 171 miles per hour, wow. and it will not leak if it's raining at 54 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and then you also might want to look at impact ratings. So you're, if you're in an area where you have frequent storms, you might want to look at getting either impact-resistant glass or what the impact rating is. Interesting. With patio doors, they do have Energy Star ratings. So probably, the, if you don't want to memorize all these different things, just look for an Energy Star qualified door, and you know uh -huh. that you're getting something that's energy efficient. Right. It's hitting these minimums. And then they also have a rating, whether it's North, North Central, South Central, or South mm -hmm. in the U.S., and if, you, if you're going online and doing some research or if you're in a store, I would definitely try to get a door that's Energy Star rated for my area. Right. With your patio doors, you're going to have double or triple pane windows, and these are going to be sealed so they're energy efficient. You can upgrade this to have either argon gas or krypton or some other gas in there rather than air, mm -hmm. and it's going to make it even more energy efficient. And then argon is the next step up. It's less expensive than krypton. The National Glass Association says that studies show that up to 1% of this gas can leak every year. Hmm. But even after 20 years, they found that it's still more efficient than air-filled. Interesting. 
If you live at 3,500 feet or more above sea level, you want to make sure that you're looking for high altitude patio doors when you're shopping. Why? What's wild is if these patio doors are manufactured at a lower altitude, and let's say you live in Denver, and they mm-hmm. ship them to you, it can the glass can actually bow out or they can rupture. Oh, that would suck. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? So you have special glass units. They have either capillary tubes or breather tubes. Mm-hmm. And with these, you're not going to put argon in because the capillary tubes are going to allow the gas to pass through and equalize the air pressure. If you get breather tubes, these tubes are open, and once it's shipped to a higher altitude and it equalizes, then you're going to cap those off hmm. and seal them. And that way you're not going to get fogging between the glass. <laughs> for security, if you have sliding patio doors, I would check for security locks and bars. Mm-hmm. Some styles can actually be pried up if they don't have special locks. So especially the older styles of patio doors, you can right. get a pull and pry bar and pry it up from the bottom and actually pull it up and out of the track hmm. and just walk in the house. I saw a couple of these reports where they were talking to burglars, mm-hmm. and what they love about the textured glass, or the tempered glass, rather, in patio doors is if they know that the family's gone, they would just take a hammer and tap it, and it would shatter the glass, and they just walk right through that opening. So they're not going to get scary, cut. scary, isn't it? Well, what's wild is, is they don't mind these security systems that are attached to the doors right, yeah. because they're not opening the door. <laughs> they just hit the patio doors, mm-hmm. they walk right through, they steal everything from the house and walk walk right back out. So what they have a nice big opening to right. go through, too. <laughs> yeah. So what they're saying is what dissuades a lot of burglars is having these glass break alarms. So you want a sticker and you want the alarm so it's visual. Mm-hmm. So if a thief or a burglar comes up, they see that and they're just going to go to your neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> You can get foot bolts for sliding doors. They have a, usually a couple positions. So when the door is shut, you can drop this bolt down into the track, and that's going to keep it from moving. Mm-hmm. And then you can open it up, let's say, three inches, and there's another setting where now you can get air ventilation, but people can't pry it open easily. Mm. With French doors, I would look for multi-point locks. So you're going to either see three-point or five-point. The mm-hmm. more is better. And they're going to have a variety of rollers, hooks, tongues, or dead bolts, and then they have chute bolts. So you've got this bolt that goes up the top and the bottom Mm -hmm. and locks the doors in place. And many of these are going to have a similar system. When you open your door, let's say the active door, you push down on a lever and now you're able to open the door. When you close your door and lift up on it, it drives these multi-point locks. So Mm. it's going to drive up these bolts and hooks Mm -hmm. and lock it in position. And then when you turn the dead bolt, it locks it all so nothing can be opened, even from the inside, unless you op- unlock that deadbolt. So hmm. they say that that's the most secure for French doors. For glass break alarms, Honeywell Dual Tech Glass Break Detector, Bosch, B-O-S-C-H, Glass Break, and Sabre, S-A-B-R-E, Window Alarm were all top rated. Mm-hmm. Master Lock has a dual function security bar, and you can use this on hinged or sliding doors. It's adjustable. Mm-hmm. And then you can always run down to the hardware store and have them cut you a wood doll. Right. Just to keep that door from sliding. Like the size of the track. Right, yeah, I would measure the track. You can also get Jimmy Plate or an anti Jimmy door plate, and this takes up the space from above the door so it can't be lifted out of its track. Mm -hmm. And then you can also buy a spring lock. So you attach this to the top of the door, and then a pin drives up into the upper track, and it keeps it from moving or being pried. Anderson has something that's called Verilock security sensors, and this integrates with some of their patio doors, Mm -hmm. and this will tell you whether the door is open or unlocked. Oh, that's cool. And in that interview I saw with a couple of these burglars, Mm -hmm. they said it's amazing how many people forget to lock their patio doors, so they just walk (laughs) in the back. And then some of the Stanley patio doors have an anti-lift sash that's already built in Mm -hmm. and high security locking systems. I would look at the screens and how they work, what's available. If you have French doors, get full length or full width screens because now you can have both doors open for ventilation, for Mm -hmm. parties. You can get shades or blinds between the glass, or you can get grills permanently sealed in there. With the shades and the blinds, you can raise them and lower them and tilt them with a control bar. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty wild. So they're never going to get dirty or dusty. Right. You don't have to worry about kids or cats climbing up on top of them. And then when you have built-in shades, it really makes it more energy efficient because you can close that Mm -hmm. and stop the sunlight. And then some companies like Pella have snap-in shades behind glass that are like a kit 
and they can be replaced with other types of grills or shades oh, so you can cool. get different looks. Yeah, it's interesting. If you have existing doors and you want to add this look to it, mm -hmm. ODL Add-on Blinds has this kit that goes over your glass and it houses the mini blinds behind glass. Hmm. So that's pretty cool. And then if you have a bad screen and you just need a new screen to add to your doors, you can get kits for that also. Right. You can just measure the height and the width, and you can measure the track. And one of the top-rated companies is Metro Screenworks. With patio doors, you're going to need to replace your weather strip over time. Most manufacturers say about once every 10 years. And if you know the manufacturer of the door, you can contact them. Usually customer service will send you replacement parts. They're usually going to need the number from the label or the manual, so keep your paperwork. Mm -hmm. And you can also send them a couple pictures and email them. Right. If you don't know the make or the model, you can check with your local hardware store. If they do screen and storm repair or window repair, they'll usually have a source for replacement weather strip. Mm -hmm. And then I was trying to find a couple companies online, and I spoke to Swissco.com. So it's S-W-I-S-C-O.com. And they have this online form that you can fill out to replace your weather strip. And they also have technicians to help identify your parts. Oh, that's so you can either talk them through, they can you know work you through what type you have, or you can send them mm -hmm. pics. They have a research team, hmm. and then they have all <laughs> these pictures on their website. And you can also send them a physical sample. So you can cut a small section out and, and <laughs> mail it to them, and they'll figure out what you need. Well, that's so, so that's a pretty cool company. After you've picked your patio door, you need to measure the opening size or your rough opening so that you can purchase the new door. Mm -hmm. And the easiest way to do that is on the inside of the house, you're going to remove your trim. And once you take that off, you need to see the size between the two studs. So the whole unit, you're going to have those side jams that the doors close on. There's going to be a space, and then you've got the two vertical studs on both sides of the frame, and you need that width there. A lot of times you can't see it because of the drywall, so behind that trim you're going to have to knock loose a piece or cut some away so mm -hmm. that you can see the 2x4 stud or 2x6 stud that's there. Measure that width, and then you need to know the height. The easiest way for that is go outside and put your tape measure under the threshold and go up to the top of the unit, mm -hmm. take that measurement, and then inside you want to see the difference between the top of the unit and that header, hmm. that main piece of wood that's going horizontal on the right. top. Add those two measurements together, and you're going to have your height. Because inside, you can't really get a good measurement because the carpet or the flooring is usually on, in right. the way. So once you have that, you're also going to measure the depth of the jam, and this is your rough opening size. And you want to check the door that you're going to be installing or the door that you're going to order, and you usually want this rough opening three-quarters of an inch wider and a half an inch higher than what you're purchasing. <laughs> when you have the new door and you're ready to remove the old one, I would start with removing one panel or one door at a time. And How do you then, do that? So you can either just, like with the sliding glass doors, in most cases you can lift them up and out. And a lot of times this is going to be a two-man job, mm -hmm. so you can, you can make sure it's level because it's sometimes hard to get by yourself. With hinge doors, they're very easy just to unscrew them and take right. them off the hinge. And then I would look, you're going to have either nails or screws holding the unit together, and sometimes you're going to have both. So a pull and pry bar is a great tool along with a reciprocating saw. And you can use a reciprocating saw, and I would have a nail cutting blade in there. Mm -hmm. And you can either cut your frame in half or, you know, in, in pieces, or you can just go between the unit itself and the studs or the header and cut through those screws mm. and just drop the whole unit out. Once everything is removed, you want to make sure that the floor or the sill is level and in good shape. Some manufacturers want you to add a sill pan or metal flashing to protect wood from moisture. Hmm. And most manufacturers are now recommending that you use a flexible self-adhesive flashing. And this is going to conform to the shape of the surface. It's a rubber-like material. Mm -hmm. And so you start by covering the sill and then up each side two to six inches. Mm -hmm. And it's going to seal out moisture. It's going to protect it. And then any nails or screws that pass through it, it's self-sealing. So it's really a nice product. You now are going to put a continuous bead of sealant over this flexible flashing from jam to jam and then into the corners. And you want at least three beads. You want to put one in the front, the middle, and the back of the sill. 
and some manufacturers suggest also running a wavy bead of sealant under the threshold mm -hmm. so it's going to give you better moisture control and then one installation instruction manual I was reading said just use the whole tube of sealant <laughs> 100% silicone is generally the best for projects like this. It's waterproof when cured, stays flexible in extreme temperature conditions, and usually has a 50-year warranty. Mm. But I would check the manual to see That's what type. Good. Yeah, I would see what type of silicone that they or what type of sealant that they recommend. Mm -hmm. And with this, I usually like using a clear silicone in case a little bit bleeds through. Right. You know, it doesn't show up, and then you once it's cured, you can just cut it with a utility knife. Mm -hmm. Once your sealant's in place with a helper, you want to lift the unit and tilt it back so that the bottom goes down first into the sealant, and then you're going to tip the top into place. Some units are going to have a metal fin all around the unit that you're going to nail into the studs. Mm -hmm. If it has a fin, you want to fold that out first, and then you'll put one or two nails to just lock it in place, and then you're going to level and plumb it and shim it up. And then some units are going to need to be screwed into the studs rather than having this metal fin around the outside of it. And so you're going to need to shim and adjust for square, level, and plumb. And then look at the inst installation instructions for your model. Mm -hmm. But in general, you're going to center the unit between the studs. You're going to use shims at the top, middle, and bottom. And then you're going to run a pilot hole first, and you're going to drive screws through the jam, the shim and then into the stud and lock it into place. Hmm. You're then going to attach it to the header and some models you may screw it into the threshold if you're in an area where you have high velocity wind storms. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to use a low expansion foam like the Red Devil foam and fill or great stuff window and door and this doesn't over expand right. because it can potentially bow your jam. Well, it's important to use the regular formulas. Yeah, it's weird. It's weird how you would you wouldn't think it would have enough strength to change the shape of your jam. Well, have you? Yeah, I have. You seen it expand? Yeah, it's crazy though. Yeah, you... it's wild. <laughs> but it expands. It completely takes the shape of that void. So you're mm -hmm. going to have an airtight, waterproof seal. So very easy to do. And then you want to adjust your doors, put on all your trim. You're going to caulk inside and out, and nothing to this job. <laughs> What are some top-rated companies? You've got Pella, P-E-L-L-A, Anderson, Geld Wen, J-E-L-D-W-E-N, Stanley Doors. You know, Stanley Doors is interesting. In 1931, they made the first hands-free door opener using mm. photoelectric cells, and they called it the Magic Eye Door. Mm. You've got Masonite and Thermatrue, and Thermatrue is T-H-E-R-M-A-T-R-U. Do you have anything else to add? I would say when you're picking a door and doing your research, make sure that you're aware of what side opens, what's the active door, right? because that's important. And then also, is it an in-swing or out-swing, and which one of those is the active door? Mm -hmm. I would always get low-E glass. And then if you're searching online or a home center, I would sort your search by your zone, either north, central, or south if you're in the U.S., and you're going to get the best features for your area. Right, look and, for Energy Star. Yeah, that's just goof-proof. I really like the Energy Star. And the warranty. Absolutely. And then use flexible self-adhesive flashing. Mm -hmm. They say that new research, it just really does a great job of isolating moisture and keeping weather out. And then start early in the day. <laughs> yeah, check the weather report. <laughs> Let's wrap this up. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, the Spotify mobile app, and the Google Play Music app. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our home improvement videos on our YouTube channel, Fix It Home Improvement. And you can subscribe to that as well. You can check out our book on Amazon, Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know. And I am almost done with I've all of my... <laughs> soon. If you enjoyed the book, please book leave three. us a... <laughs> soon. <laughs> please leave us a five-star rating and review. You can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next week.